afternoon and welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast edition. Today is Monday, August 1st, and my, isn't the year just flying by? We are now just three months away from the midterm elections, and a lot of what we're talking about today is relating to the political environment of these midterm elections. And I make the case in at least a couple of posts this morning that media analysts are really not grasping the difference in what the political context is going to be for the 2022 election as opposed to 2018, as opposed to 2014, as opposed to 20, uh, 2010, or even the presidential election of 2020. This is an environment we haven't seen in over 40 years. You've got runaway inflation, you've got high interest rates, or at least interest rates, and they're not high, but they're, they're starting to tick up very fast. And you've got shortages, you've got a deeply unpopular president uh, in the White House. This is not 2018. 2018, you had an unpopular president in the White House, but not as unpopular as Joe Biden is. And you had a relatively good economy, which meant that other issues came to the fore. Healthcare was the primary issue in 2018, and Democrats rode that to a mini blue wave. Uh, they ended up with uh, control of the uh, control of the House, not of the Senate, but they ended up with control of the House. And they were able to deflect a lot of what Donald Trump could do after that, in part because of the popularity issue. And of course, we had the pandemic in 2020, which upset the apple cart in all sorts of different directions. But this midterm is different. The pandemic is over. You've got runaway inflation, shortages, all the things that I just said. And I don't think that political analysts are grasping what that means. All you have to do is take a look at the 1980 election to understand what that means. Uh, the Democrats lost a significant amount of ground in 1980. They lost 12 Senate seats in 1980. They lost, um, I think it was 35 House seats, and of course lost the presidency. That was a presidential election cycle. The turnout model is going to be very, very different in this uh, particular election cycle. It's not going to be 2018. De Texas Democrats are saying that they're upbeat about Beto O'Rourke's chances. I wrote about that today, too. Um, but they're, they're saying it's because he's a closer. He, he closed the gap in 2018. Well, yeah, it was a Democratic blue wave election in 2018, too. And Beto was, hard, was not very well known prior to that election cycle. He became very well known in that election cycle and then ran for president uh, in, in 2019, or the, the Democratic presidential nomination anyway. So he's not, a, he's not an unknown factor anymore. He's not a new guy. He's a very old guy in terms of politics young guy in terms of life, but this he's not a surprise anymore. And so the, the idea that you're going to have Beto O'Rourke become a closer in this kind of political environment shows the fact that people really aren't grasping <laughs> the impact that the economy is going to have on voters in this cycle. They're just simply not going to sign up for more of the same, whether that's in a Texas gubernatorial election, whether that's in a Senate election, whether that's in a House election. And I think that people are making a mistake by assuming that you can you can uh, measure this election cycle by 2018. Just it's it's a completely it's going to be a completely different animal. Uh, that's not to say that Greg Abbott's doing great. He is not a terribly popular governor in Texas. But uh, in a state this red, in a cycle like this, um, it would take an, an enormous um, shift in context and shift in um, the, the currents here for uh, Abbott to lose uh, re-election here in Texas. Um, so we have that going on. There's lots of other stories coming up. Germany, France, Italy, the Netherlands, Austria, they're all shifting to coal. Why? <laughs> Because they finally realized that their addiction to cheap Russian gas uh, was a geopolitical disaster. Uh, it led to the uh, geopolitical disaster that's happening in Ukraine. That was happening in Ukraine in 2014, by the way. This is a, a, a very belated recognition that they need to stop buying energy from Russia. And it, you can even go back to 2008 in Georgia and make that same, uh, make that same determination. Uh, it's not that they weren't warned. That is something to keep in mind, though. Uh, you're going to have that. The big, I think the big story around the Beltway, right, is going to be Joe Manchin, Kirsten Cinema. As we're as we're recording this, we still don't know whether Kirsten Cinema is going to back Joe Manchin's um, deal with Chuck Schumer. 
uh, this deal with Chuck Schumer is it's sort of like that um, Adult Swim cartoon on the Cartoon Network. It's looking it, it's looking worse all the, this deal is looking worse all the time. Well, that's this deal here. The Wall Street Journal took a peek under the hood, found out that it doesn't actually do anything about deficit reduction until five years in. It doesn't do anything about inflation until 2024. And it's going to end up being a big tax against manufacturers and all sorts of other um, uh, producers at the same time that you're trying to incentivize more production in order to deal with inflation. Uh, I mean, there's two ways that you can deal with inflation, either incentivize production to meet demand or kill demand in order to meet, have it meet the, uh, the production supply. Federal Reserve is taking the second tack. But if you don't want to have those massive interest rates, what you want to do is you want to boost production so there's more supply and that it meets demand uh, more fully. Uh, they're going the exact opposite direction on this. So cinema, I, I am very skeptical that cinema is going to vote against this. I think she's going to play party politics and in, in an election year. Uh, but then she's going to have to sign off on the fact that Democrats are raising taxes as we're going into a recession, which is a really stupid idea, especially with high inflation and for the just for the reasons I just described. But I still think that she's going to play po party politics in the end. I don't think that cinema is going to rescue Republicans or the rest of the country in this case. I think she is just waiting for waiting to see maybe the, the best thing that she's trying to do is waiting to see if the Senate parliamentarian knocks out enough provisions of this uh, so that the deal falls apart and she doesn't have to take a position on it. But my guess is that she's going to hold her nose and vote for this thing. Lots more coming up. The misery index returns, by the way, I talked about that, you know, you're talking about 40 plus years of, uh, you know, a 40 plus year political environment. Well, the misery index is back. I explained what that's about in my VIP post today. I talk about how Paul Krugman is all wet in his attempt to say that there's nothing wrong with this economy. Nothing at all. Trust me. Uh, and claims that the economy, that, that the negative views of the economy is because of media coverage, which is absurd. It is so disconnected from reality. Uh, we got other stuff too coming up. Uh, we've got uh, we we've had all upon walk uh, talking about Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, which somehow got confirmed. I, I mean, I'm not sure that I would have wanted to do that until she was actually on the ground there. Um, and also about how Team Biden thinks that they can run again in 2024 by making uh, Joe Biden the second coming of Ronald Reagan, after Joe Biden himself made himself the second coming of FDR and LBJ. I would say good luck with that, but be sure to read all of Pundit's post on that. It's going to be fun, and uh, you're really going to enjoy that. Now, Karen Townsend is filling in for me in the afternoon today. I've got some other uh, engagements, so I have to make sure that we've got those posts coming up. And she's got some great stuff, by the way. Karen uh, Townsend is one of our uh, part-time contributors. You can find her on Twitter at Penguin Ponders, at Penguin Ponders. So be sure to check that out. Coming up now, however, is... A second conversation that I, I have had with Governor Luis Fortunio regarding the uh, bill that's percolating in Congress to, uh, to actually allow for a referendum in Puerto Rico for them to determine what their future status will be with the United States. This would be a binding resolution, which has not happened yet. It, C Congress has never authorized a binding resolution on this, or a binding referendum, I should say, on this. Um, that bill is percolating. You'd be surprised who's holding it up and why. And Governor Luis Fortunio is very clear about who's holding this up and why. So stay tuned for more for uh, Governor Luis Fortunio from Puerto Rico, former governor, uh, Luis Fortunio from Puerto Rico, and stay tuned for more from The Ed Morrissey Show. Welcome back to The Ed Morrissey Show. And as you've just seen, we are welcoming back uh, governor Luis Fortunio, uh, former governor of Puerto Rico, to talk about, well, the status. We, we, we had you on, Governor, about six or seven weeks ago, and we thought that the A bill, some bill, was going to drop in Congress that would allow Puerto Rico to, um, to you know, it's to have some self-determination on what its future status was going to be, either as a, uh, a state, an independent country, or as a... I guess it's uh, it's a free association. Territory is not the right word, but it's uh, no. It, it will be uh, like a, a uh, an associated republic. So it would yes. have its own 
independence, but then will join an association with the United States. Uh, we already have uh, with the Micronesian Islands uh, a sort of a, a same same type of relationship where they they became an independent country and and then but then they agreed to enter into uh, an uh, you know a, I think it's a 25 year agreement that could be renewed by both parties uh, uh, or canceled by either party uh, where certain uh, issues are handled by the United States, like defense, for example, and so, some other issues. That sounds pretty complicated. Statehood or independence probably is a little bit more um, is is a little bit more cut and dried, and and leaves leaves nothing really to the imagination. I know that you favor statehood because we've talked before about uh, about where you stand on this, but I'm just curious as to where Congress stands on this because here we are, six or seven weeks later. And it doesn't look like we still, it still doesn't look like we actually have a bill that's moving into any sort of prep stage here. Yes, uh, actually last week, the uh, House Natural Resources Committee approved legislation that would provide for precisely uh, uh, that vote by the eligible voters on the island. Uh, however, uh, uh, there is a doubt as to whether there'll be enough votes uh, on the House floor to get it through. We'll see. We'll see what happens here. My understanding is that uh, uh, people like AOC uh, and others are opposing it. Uh, they they know better, I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, what's best for us. Uh, and then uh, my understanding is also that on Republican ranks, I believe mostly because of misunderstanding of what the political reality is uh, in Puerto Rico and the fact that uh, it is a, a uh, God-fearing, hardworking, uh, 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 not socially conservative jurisdiction and ha that has elected uh, very conservative leaders statewide several times. Uh, uh, some of them also posted that we discussed a little bit of that did, yeah. uh, in, in your uh, the last time I was on your show. Yeah, we did. And I mean, this is a, it's really honestly the type of demographic that Republicans are actually having a lot of success with over the last couple of years, in part because they've, they're have they taking the time to get to know those communities. And maybe they're not doing that um, with Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. I think they're doing a better job of that with Puerto Ricans in, you know, sort of like the diasporic communities in Florida and, and New York um, and some of the other and states. Pennsylvania. Here. Pennsylvania. And is a, yeah. You'd be surprised. And there is an important uh, senatorial race as well as gubernatorial ranks this year in Pennsylvania, and uh, and whomever and and there is at least one congressional seat that may be decided by by uh, uh, this voting bloc, uh, and and you know it's up for grabs really. Well, yes, and and again, I think it has to do with getting to know the voters, and and Republicans are a little bit better about that than they used to be. Uh, but I, I think that this is also part of the issue in terms of Puerto Rico, because they see Puerto Rico statehood is similar to Washington, D.C. statehood. Right. I mean, this is something that the Republicans are never going to let go through and, and for much better reasons. Washington, D.C. just constitutionally is a federal government town and it's not really a state. It's a city that is a federal that is basically the seat of federal government. And neither of those two things qualify as a state, but Puerto Rico is a different matter. Puerto Rico is its own community. Um, it really doesn't have anything to do with the federal government, other than the fact that the federal government right now has jurisdiction um, in terms of it being in American territory. But that's no different than, say, Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, uh, you know, even the great state of Texas, <laughs> where I'm <laughs> where I'm talking to you from. Uh, I mean, we yes. were all territories at one point, and and um, well, Texas was a republic, but. Uh, was admitted to the to the union, so I mean this is really no different process than that, and it's it's <laughs> Puerto Rico's. It's taken a lot longer for Puerto Rico to get to a point where they can actually choose that than than say Arizona or Utah or some of the other interior West states. Indeed, and and I would say uh, initially uh, there may have been some uh, resistance because the other the lower forty eight are contiguous states. Right. And uh, but with uh, the admission of Hawaii and Alaska, I believe that barrier uh, uh, was surpassed and, and we are beyond that now. And the fact that uh, 
Again, we've been uh, American citizens, um, natural born American citizens, now for over a hundred years. Right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, actually makes us, uh, I would say, a, a unique uh, uh, jurisdiction uh, in the history of the of the country. Uh, I would, if I may, I'd love to go back briefly to the, what you mentioned about DC. I, my understanding, and I have studied this a little bit, my, the way I look at it is that in order to make D.C. a state, regardless of whether, you know, the fact that uh, it's, it, you know, the founding fathers have, had a very different intention uh, with, with th that area, is that I believe you would need a constitutional amendment. Uh, in the case of Puerto Rico, it would be uh, so easy. It would be exactly what was done with, with the other 37, uh, 36 territories and one republic. <laughs> uh, uh, um, so exactly the same process, which is, uh, uh, you know, an admissions bill and having a process. And, you know, Congress may may require certain things, a transition period on taxes or whatever. And that's that, that has been done in the past several times. Right, right. I mean, that's that's a process. That's not a and, and this is a process that we've used, like you said, 37 times since the founding of this country most recently in 1959. So it's not as though it's a big, huge mystery. And and I would say that the same reasons why that process was used in 1959 for Alaska and Hawaii apply to Puerto Rico too. There are uh, national security interests in firming up a relationship with um, Puerto Rico, especially as a state. Um, and there are certainly, you know, there's, there's tax interests, there's, there's legal interests, uh, but certainly strategic interests in, in that particular corner of the world. And I think that, that we we already know that because we've got military, you know, we, we do military operations in Puerto Rico. So we're already well aware of the strategic. And there's an army base. Uh, there's an army base uh, and, and there are a couple of smaller bases. And I'll bring this to what's happening uh, in 2022. Russia, China, Iran and Venezuela recently announced naval exercises in the region. Uh, it is our own backyard. We cannot allow this to happen and simply not understand that firming up that relationship uh, of the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico with uh, the rest of the Union uh, is key to our national interests in so many ways and I will say geopolitically and militarily is just another one of those. Right. And, uh, and I completely agree with that. Um, and that's true whether or not we're going to be, uh, whether or not Puerto Rico is going to be a sovereign state. Although this is not really, in a certain way, part of, part of this is a, a choice for Congress to make in terms of whether or not they're going to admit Puerto Rico as a state. That is still a choice that Congress makes. But I think everybody right now is... I think if there's a consensus at all, it's that the people of Puerto Rico should choose what their status is going to be, and, the, and Congress should really accept what that choice is. Now, that's not that's not a 100% consensus, because as you mentioned, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez has, uh, after sort of initiate, you know, getting the ball rolling on this, you know, because she was one of the people that was kind of pushing for this, has decided that she really wants to, um, she wants her particular vision for this and her particular process too. There was a, uh, and this is part of the debate too, as to whether or not you have a plebiscite or whether or not you have a, a convention in Puerto Rico to make this decision. And I, I'd, I'd like to talk about what it is that um, uh, Representative Ocasio-Cortez has said about what, what Puerto Rico should should do here. And then a little bit about that, the, the weird sort of idea that you should just hold a convention rather than just ask, you know, have, hold a vote in Puerto Rico. Well, uh, Puerto Rico already has a state constitution. It was authorized by the U.S. Congress uh, and approved uh, by the voters. And then the U.S. Congress actually to the week 70 years ago. So again, we don't need a new const state constitution. And uh, normally you have uh, uh, constitutional conventions for that purpose. Secondly, I would say that uh, a determination that is as important as this one ought to be decided by the voters directly, not by individuals that we choose and then they do whatever they please. 
you know, so uh, again, uh, that's why I, I, I strongly oppose her idea. And actually, it is opposed by the vast majority of voters in Puerto Rico. So uh, 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 why not go uh, with with the bill that just came out of uh, of the Natural Resources Committee of the House? Yeah, I, I mean, I just don't understand the whole idea of doing a convention rather than rather than just holding a plebiscite. Plebiscite, first off, is easier to do. It might be a little yeah. costlier, but it's easier to do. And it gets everybody involved in this rather than the activists who would naturally gravitate and become concentrated in a convention. And, um, you know, we have lots of conventions here in, in, in the, in the contiguous 48 here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend going to any of them, but uh, that's, not true. <laughs> that's not true. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But I mean, it's usually a forum for people who are just activists and that's true of party conventions. That's true of conventions of, of all stripes. It's, it's, it's not a representative um, process, whereas voting is very representative. Everybody gets a vote. If and everybody actually, wants to cast a vote, can cast. A I vote. would say a constitutional convention will be costlier. And the reason yep. for it is that you would have a vote to elect those delegates to the constitutional convention. So either way, you're going to have a vote. But then you you are creating a new government entity. Who wants more government entities nowadays? Right. I want less. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so is is she pushing for independence? Is that what the, is that really where? Yeah, that's what's says? behind this. That's what's behind this. And since independence doesn't have uh, the support of the of the majority of the people, actually, it's only the support of a, min a small minority, a most a small fraction of the voters. Uh, this is a, a, actually a backdoor way uh, to get uh, what she prefers, and it makes no sense. And it's being supported by. Uh, extreme left groups in in the U.S. mainland, mostly New York and other areas like that. Well, you know, and it's it's kind of I, I'm sure I understand what the what the justification here is is that Puerto Rico has been the the victim of American colonialism, which is arguable. I mean, I, I, I mean, we can we can debate that all day long too. But but the only way to fully expiate that is to just grant them independence and. Um, and even if that's not what they want, that's the only way they exactly. can solve the problem. <laughs> that's, well, you know, <laughs> because some people feel that they know better. Uh, is, isn't that colonialism? <laughs> it is. Uh, at a, at a, of the worst kind, by the way. Uh, let the voters decide. Uh, and and we have a you know we have a strong educational system. Uh, the percentage of our uh, uh, of our uh, population that that has a college degree is actually. Uh, higher than uh, most states. Uh, so we have an educated voter uh, base. Uh, let the voters decide. At the end of the day, voters are wise and they know what's best for them. Right. I mean, that's the whole basis of, you know, democracy, right? Is that precisely voters govern themselves. I, you know, that's that's the purpose of democracy. It's a, it's self-governance. And that is, to be fair, something that Puerto Rico has has been allowed to, to a certain extent, but not fully, uh, in its um, in its status as a, well, its status as a Spanish territory, and then its status as an American territory, yeah. um, never really had an opportunity for full um, self determination until hopefully, when this bill finally gets passed in both chambers of Congress. In, indeed, and uh, I must say, uh, after. Uh, 400 years of Spanish colonialism. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico changed hands uh, as a result of the Spanish-American War in 1898 and became uh, a U.S. territory. Well, that hasn't changed since then. And, uh, and it is true that during those years, especially during the first half a century, uh, we came a long way in the sense that eventually uh, Congress authorized uh, the uh, celebration of a uh, of a constitutional uh, 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 convention and the approval of a state constitution, like all the other fifty states have. Uh, so, so we came a long way, and we elect our governors and and legislature, state legislature, just the same way that the other fifty states do. So, so in that sense, we are a, a mirror image of how states run their own affairs 
however, there's a big difference here, and that is that uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, especially in the last 50 years or so, the federal government has taken over uh, significant, uh, uh, actually, uh, power uh, away from the states. Uh, but it is at least those states are represented in the federal government through their elected representatives, both in the House and the Senate in Washington. Puerto Rico doesn't have that, and, and that puts Puerto Rico at a tremendous disadvantage. So, Governor Fortunio, um, the, the way that this bill is structured coming out of the uh, Natural Resources Committee in the House, uh, and again, that still has to go to the to the full House floor for passage, then it's got to go to the Senate. Um, but the way it's structured is that there's going to be three choices. We started off talking about the three choices, independent statehood and this free association um, relationship. Um, the plebiscite, though, is going to require a majority of voters to make a choice. And that leaves you with a potential for a runoff. Now, is that something that you think is going to be, I mean, does that sound like a workable process for you? Or is this something that really should be, everybody just gets out and votes and we'll just pick the winner type of thing. I'm a little concerned about doing a runoff, having people get a little tired out of this, and then hopefully, you know, at least trusting that Congress will actually listen to him this time, because th there's been plebiscites before. I, I share your concern. Having said that, however, realize that this bill is a result of a compromise. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, amongst different, you know, uh, groups in Congress. And I, I also understand that uh, especially whether it's independence or statehood, uh, that's that's uh, that's forever. That's yeah. that's like getting you know uh, you know getting married. Well, supposedly uh, uh, <laughs> is supposed to be forever. Well, uh, you know we, uh, for example, let's say uh, we got, we come a state. I, I fully understand and respect that some people in Congress may say, well, uh, you know, fifty-one to forty-nine will not cut it. And I understand that. And I believe that uh, that compromise tried to address uh, that very, uh, uh, very issue that, that we just discussed. Right. And again, what you don't want to do in this case is allow the perfect to become the enemy of the good. Right. This bill is yeah. good because it actually commits Congress. Now, I'm I'm I'm. I'm guessing at this, so maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but this bill actually commits Congress to following through on what the results of that plebiscite would be. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to rubber stamp it, but it does put a lot of pressure on Congress. If you have a, you know, a significant majority picking one status um, for the future of Puerto Rico, uh, it does create a, at least some political pressure on Congress to to work with Puerto Rico to achieve that. And I think even more importantly, Governor Fortunio, is it puts a lot of pressure on Congress to stop accepting the status quo of territorial, uh, of Puerto Rico being being just a territory of the United States. And that this is actually a, sort of a, a crossing a line that says, we're actually going to do something this time, uh, as opposed to decades of just talking about it. Yes, yes, it does. It is not a legal obligation, right. but as you mentioned, I, I'll say it's a political and moral obligation uh, to do something. And I will tell you something, uh, and this has been, uh, actually I've seen many polls about this. The moment the US Congress provides for a formal process to vote on the future status of Puerto Rico, the decision, it, it will be lopsided. It will not be a 51-49 decision by the voters. It will be an overwhelming majority uh, that will be akin to what we have seen in other territories that became states. Uh, so, but that, but that is key. Uh, Congress has to uh, provide for legislation uh, that that at least politically and morally puts the onus on it uh, to act upon the result of of that plebiscite. So I, I would say that that uh, you know it's it it's a compromise bill. It's not perfect as you were uh, referring to earlier, but but it certainly provides for that that pathway that so many of us have been waiting for.
Yeah, I, and, and I think that this is because it becomes a decision point for Puerto Rico voters too, because they know it's it's meaningful at that point. Um, exactly. So, so it's it's it, when things become meaningful, then people take give you the, their most serious um, consideration of the different options, and I think that that is. Uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to to phrase this, but this is sort of the crisis point is not the the right word because it's not a crisis. But uh, decision point, I guess it's uh, it's it's a point where where that where things actually matter. You're going to get people who are going to give this really due consideration and look at what it is that they really want uh, for their future and make a commitment to it. And so I think if you get a 75-25 for statehood, I think people in the United States can feel comfortable saying this was Puerto Rico's choice. A again, if you get 75-25 for independence, which I think you don't really foresee. But if you do get 75-25 for independence, then we can feel comfortable that that's really what Puerto Rico wanted. And it is it, whatever decision we make will not have been the result of a patronizing, condescending, or you know, even colonial sort of approach to Puerto Rico, which Puerto Rico's had quite enough of, <laughs> I think, at this point in time. I agree. I agree with you. And, uh, and so that's why I'm supportive of, of, of uh, this bill. And I certainly hope that uh, the full house will take it up uh, at this moment. It, it points. It, it seems like it will be once uh, they come back from the uh, after Labor Day, uh, and uh, and you know we'll see we'll see what happens. And you know, assuming the House gets it through, then then we'll, we can talk about the Senate. Yeah, well, I'll have you back to talk about the Senate. I, I'm curious. Yeah. Um, do you suspect, though, that this Congress might punt this to the post midterm election period where it won't be as tied up in the electoral politics of, you know, reelections in this cycle where it may be somewhere between the second week of November and the end of the year is where this might wind up getting more consideration? Um, I suspect that that might be the case. Uh, I, I I can't foresee it, but I I would think that this is something that, with with members of Congress being as courageous as they usually are, Governor Fortunio, that this is a really good way to a really good way to not not provide something that tweaks the voters even more in this very delicate cycle. I I you know I agree with your uh, uh, assessment and and believe that that may very well be the case. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll but see that, what, and, what, that would what still happens. Be, yeah. That would still be all right, though. I mean, it really would. Yes. I yes. mean, obviously, you want this to pass as soon as possible so that Puerto Rico can prepare for this. But if it passes on November 10th rather than September 10th, it still passes and you guys still get a chance to really take control of your destiny in Puerto Rico. And after 120 years of waiting, another extra couple of months <laughs> won't make a difference. <laughs> Well put. Well put. Well, um, Governor Luis Fortuño, is there some place that people can go to see what, uh, you know, your efforts on this or, or just what you're doing these days and uh, you know, websites or anything else like that? Uh, social media uh, links? Uh, well, well, uh, there he is. Uh, however, I have a foundation that uh, promotes self-reliance uh, and, uh, and hard work and, uh, and freedom uh, for people. Uh, as well as economic freedom, and uh, and that, that foundation is uh, you can go to uh, it's called Crece C R E C E. So you, you can go to Centro Crece C E N T R O C N T R C R C R E C E dot org, and and you can see it's in both languages, and you can see all the work we're doing. All right, c e c r e c e dot org is the is the um. It's it, Centro C E N as in name T S in Thomas R O Centro, okay. then uh, all together Crece C R E C E dot org. There you go dot org. I'm typing it up right now just so I can make sure I've got it right for uh, later on. C uh, uh, Centro Crece dot org and C E N T R O C R E C E dot org, and that is where yes. you can go to find out more about what uh, Governor Luis Fortuño is working on uh, and and all of the fine efforts that he is making 
not just on um, not just on his own behalf, but on behalf of Puerto Rico and behalf of people all over the place. Governor Luis Fortunio, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Can't wait to talk to you again about this when this thing starts moving. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much, Ed. Good day. Stay tuned for more from the Ed Morrissey Show. Thank you for watching and listening to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast. Be sure to subscribe at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube to get alerted as soon as new episodes get published. You can support the Ed Morrissey Show and Hot Air's VIP reporting by becoming a VIP member, too. Visit hotairvip.com and use the promo code SAVEAMERICA, all one word, for 40% off your membership. Choose VIP Gold and gain membership to access to all of the town hall sites. Thanks again for watching and listening.